Turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. As we finish our series in uh, Colossians, I've enjoyed this uh, book. Hopefully you have also. We come to uh, kind of the, there's still a couple more passages in here that we could kind of mine out of, but the next passage, uh, as we finish our, uh, we finish the sermon today, uh, starts in verse 18. It talks about the relationship between husbands and wives. And I think that's a really important subject, and I want to hold off on it. I want to do a sermon on uh, marriage in the future, and so I want to hold that passage and save that passage to use with that. So I'm not avoiding that passage, especially in today's culture. Uh, this topic of marriage and what a godly marriage looks like is vitally important to us to understand because the family, the nuclear family, the way God designed families is literally the foundation of our society. Not only our society, every successful society in history. When they follow the precepts of what God gives us for a marriage, for a family, it's so important. And that's why we see today, we see the attack on the family. So that's a subject we will come back to, so I'm not avoiding it. There's some more nuggets as we finish up Colossians, but uh, it's time for us to move on to the next thing. And so we're looking forward to, uh, to those sermons uh, coming in the future. This morning, I want to, as we dive into Colossians, we're going to talk about a peaceful life. In this past week, probably you've seen that there's been an attack, and I'm not sure why. I think it was Dr. Seuss's birthday, but all of a sudden, Dr. Seuss's books are bad for us. Dr. Seuss's books are dangerous, and, and Dr. Seuss's books should be banned. Now, I've read to our kids, and I think we still have some of them sitting around. I, I'm not sure what the hubbub is about them. I, they, half of them don't make sense. They're silly little rhymes that are fun for kids to read to kids. But there's one in particular that's being banned that I remember, and one of the reasons I remember, it's called All the Places You Can Go. And All the Places You Can Go was actually an uh, interesting book. Uh, the reason I, one of the reasons I remember it is uh, a wedding I did about five or six years ago, maybe a little longer. Uh, time goes by fast. This young couple, in their service, they read this book. They had one of their friends stand up and read it. And when we were prepping for the wedding, I was like, ah, I don't know, man, a nursery rhyme book at your wedding? Seriously, this is what you're going to go with, right? No special music. This was it. They were going to read it. And when they read the book, it's a, it's a cute little book. It really was, it kind of made a neat tone to the service. Because the point was, together all the places they would go together as a couple, all the things that they would do, the, the, the history they would have together. And it was really kind of cute when it turned out. And that's the sense of the book is, is really, now that you're ready, you can go out into the world and look at all the neat places you can go. And that sets, kind of sets the tone. I thought that was an interesting book because it, it, it sets the tone. Why that would be offensive to somebody, I have no idea. But this idea that we prepare ourselves and we're ready to go forward, that's really, I think, in a lot of ways, how we should be in our spiritual walk uh, with Christ. So as we look at our passage this morning, we're in uh, uh, chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgivingness in your hearts to God. And whenever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. A peaceful life is attainable through the power of Jesus. In our passage this morning, we're going to experience several uh, affirmations of God's peace. I come across a, a, a story, and this is kind of a silly... I don't even, I'm, Let me just explain. Let me read it to you, because it, it really... This is... Uh, New York Times, um, supposedly a bestseller, 
the four steps to absolute peace. The four steps were made by Dr. Uh, Histoki Kamani. Kamani is uh, identified as the Chancellor of the International Center of Earth Environment University Roundtable. So you know that's got some weight to it, right? Here's his four steps. He's got four, four simple steps. And if I read this to you, if I told you these four steps 10 years ago, we'd get a really good laugh out of it. Today we're gonna get maybe a chuckle or two, but the sad part is there's a lot of people trying to pursue some variation of this uh, today. He says this, the first one is, first step between uh, peace between mankind, which requires world disarmament. Target date, now. So disarm the world, that's the best way to go about this. Uh, we just take everybody, disarm the world, okay? Wall somehow get along peacefully. If I remember right, all the way back when we didn't have any weapons, we grabbed sticks and rocks and threw them at each other, so I'm just not sure how that's gonna work, but that's fine. It's a good goal, right? The second one is between men and animals, which requires the total abolition of uh, uh, meat in our diet, animal experimentation, and insecticides. Uh, with some of our farmers here, I think they would argue with some of those points, right? Meat is good. Cows are good to eat, I'm just telling you. I, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get along that well along with cows. But if we're gonna have total peace and harmony, we've gotta get along together. But then, this is, this is my favorite step here. Step three, because now we've accomplished the first two steps. We've disarmed the world, and we're all getting along peacefully, we're all cooperating. We've worked out our differences. We're not eating animals anymore. We're eating plants, but not the animals. I'm not sure plants are living, but I don't know why that's not taken off the menu, but that's not on this one. So is this third one. Third is peace between animals and animals, which involve control of the population, wide animals, fishes, and insects, uh, trying to get them to not kill each other or eat each other. I don't even know if I want to get into the fourth one. The fourth one is that everybody in the whole universe, all beings in the universe, will get along. I think about the, the silliness of that. It's a, you're supposedly, somebody's buying these type of books. Somebody took a lot of time to come up with this genius list of things that are literally ir, irresponsible and a waste of time to even think about. This idea of peace between animals is silly, right? It doesn't even work, our, our system, the way the ecology works doesn't work. This is senseless waste of time pursuing this. But the idea is peace. Is, see, we want peace. This gentleman in his heart of hearts wants a peaceful world. That's not necessarily a bad goal. This silly four-step process is ridiculous, but at least the goal is admirable. And that's a goal that all of us should want. We should want peace in our lives. Maybe we can't arrange peace in the world, but peace in our lives would be a good thing. As we look at our passage, I look at, at verse 12, 13, and 14, and I see the steps that if you've had, maybe in the last year or so, in the last few months, your life's been a little unsettled. Maybe it's personal things that are going on. Maybe it's just what's going on in our country or the world in general. It just seems like things are spinning fast out of control. I heard a discussion this week, uh, I was listening to a, a, a podcast, and they were talking about information. Do you realize in 2000, um, from the year 2000 to 2001, the amount of information we know as mankind doubled? So from all of history until 2000, from 2000 to 2001, we doubled that amount of information. The next year, we doubled it again, and we've been... So the information that you go along and information is rising on a chart and all of a sudden we hit 2000 and it goes like this. The chart just goes crazy, right? We've got this much more information at our fingertips. This can be unsettling. I, I think we're in a, in, a, in a historical point where this information overload is unsettling to all the systems in the world. This idea that we're unsettled isn't unnatural. There's been times in history where we see things spike like this. So this idea of pursuing peace is something that's important. So we're talking about personal peace, spiritual peace in our lives that is attainable. 
Let's look at verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, and then it starts a list. This idea of putting on, some of you are, if you're, I have the English Standard Version that I preach out of, some of you guys have King James and different ones that will say, it might say clothe, clothe yourselves. The idea, you know, today I'm wearing a, a suit jacket and I've got my tie on, you know, so I've got all these, I've got these things on, I'm putting on things. In the wintertime we add more clothing. And we put these things on. That's the imagery that we see here. Saying, put these things on. These should be part of our lives as we go out into the world. And they're in three areas. And we'll talk about the three areas. Uh, each of this, this list here. It's not just a list of things, uh, you know, just a random list for us to observe. There's things for us to do. It says, compassionate hearts. So we're put on these things. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience bearing with one another. Let's deal with the first ones. The first two are how we're to treat others. You look at compassion, kindness. We're to have compassionate hearts. This idea is compassion. It's, it's really the sense is a tenderness for those out there in our community. It's really being aware of what's going on, of thinking of other people and how they go about their business. It's having this idea of compassion. We don't see, in our culture today, we don't see a lot of compassion out there. Everybody's in a hurry, everybody's doing their thing, and sometimes compassion's overlooked. We definitely don't see it in our media, and we don't see it in some of those other things, this idea of compassion. The media can't wait to expose somebody, can't wait to tear somebody down, tear something down. And this idea, this, this action is opposite of what the world does. And you're going to see the contrast of what we're to carry forward. I've heard this thought, this kicking around idea of, and you've probably heard it too, just it's you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek to a certain extent, but this idea, wow, it's getting so crazy out there, I can't believe it, maybe there'll be a civil war out there. I don't believe we're anywhere near that. I look at how we operate within a community. I walk in my neighborhood and everybody's like, hey, 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 everybody, hi, everybody's, right? This, this tone that's set on a higher level than us in the media and stuff is not the same tone that we see in our communities today. As believers, we don't want any talk of that because we're going to go out with kindness and compassion and change people's lives for Christ. This idea of rebellion and civil war and all this stuff, we don't have to worry about that. That's not our goal. Our goal is to drive forward with compassionate hearts, with kindness. See, the, the thing is, one is to have compassion. And James talks about this. He says, look, you can have compassion. You can see that people need stuff, coats and food. But if you don't do anything about it, then well, what good is it? And that's the idea. You got compassion and kindness. Kindness is the act of, of compassion, right? It's the, the action of it. And that's kind of what the passage is driving home here for you, is to go out and be kind, be compassionate. When we're compassionate, we're on the lookout for those that are hurting. When you go to the grocery store, those people that are moving around you in, in a whirlwind, I'm not saying you have to grab people and talk to them in the grocery store. I'm just saying, use an example of looking at people. You can see those people around you, a lot of them are hurting and searching and looking for a sense of peace in their life, and they don't know where to get it. A lot of us, the more we look like we got our act together, behind the scenes is probably the faster it's falling apart. There is a need out there. There is a need for compassion. There's a need for kindness out there. What we all grew up in communities that were like that. We have the ability here this morning, there are 50 of us, 60 of us, or whatever, here, go out and be kind to our community. It will change. It's, a mad, it's, it's weird. I hate these masks because when we're out in public, we can't see each other's facial expressions. We can't. It's, it's hard to express kindness, you know, with our, you know, with our eyes, you know, you're trying to send messages to your eyes. I'm not mad that you hit me on the, with the cart. That's no big deal, you know, but this is the idea. We've got to come above and beyond that. Compassion, kindness. Let's look at uh, the next ones. Bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything in perfect harmony. So, the first two are how we treat others. The second couple of traits that we see in this passage are 
kind of a self checkup is what I'm calling it. It's a kind of way to kind of keep ourselves in check. And that is, first one is humility. This idea that, that we're putting others above ourselves. If you look at what the passage is driving, bearing with one another, and one has a complaint against another, forgiving. This idea of humility is really the idea of humility is that I'm worried about all your needs before I worry about my own needs. If I'm worrying about all your needs before I figure out what I need, and you're, and you're doing the same thing, then we're making sure everything's getting taken care of in the proper way. This isn't about ego. It's not like I got to have this and I got to have that. When that infiltrates the church, that's a hard thing because that's the opposite of the way we're supposed to be. My role as a, as a shepherd is I, I'm to take care of you guys or make sure I can help you with your spiritual needs. Your role as a congregation is to do the same thing out into our community. We're to work with each other, love on each other. You see those things, you see humility. It's acts of absence of self-importance. We see gentleness, uh, meekness is really kind of the thing. It's, it's, uh, when you think of gentleness, I think sometimes we think of weakness, and that's the wrong way to look at gentleness. I think of our wonderful warriors that we have in our military. We send them over to Iraq or wherever, you've seen it historically. They go over and they'll do battle when they've got to do battle with the bad guys, but when they are in a city or whatever and they've kind of helped liberate it and given the people freedom, they take care of the kids, they try to set up water. We, we as a country, our, our warriors go and do that. It's interesting that they, a lot of times when they come through a, a city, they'll make it better than it was uh, before they got there. That's, that's the idea, in a weird sort of way, of gentleness. This idea that doesn't mean you're not strong, doesn't mean that you're giving up uh, some of your personal strength, but we're being gentle and we're taking care of people. See, when our egos are out of the way, it's easy to be gentle with those around us. Are we gentle of spirit? Or do we have a hard spirit? Or do we have a, a spirit that's quick to anger? Notice in there too, this passage is driving home the point that we gotta forgive each other, bear with one another, forgive each other, have mercy on each other. He's talking to us as believers. Take care of each other. Then we can go out and do all that kindness and wonderful stuff that God needs us to do out in our community. If we don't forgive each other, if we don't cut each other a break, we don't try to turn the screws on each other. Because in a, in a church family, especially like a congregation like us, a lot of us have been in this church for a long time. Some of us have grown up in it. That's like a really long time, right? I grew up in a church like that. I was there until I was, you know, older. I get it. There's all these connections. We have all these family things. We have all these connecting, connecting, connecting points. But sometimes we forget that we're still a body of believers that have to forgive each other. And don't let those things that happened 10 years ago interfere with what we're doing today. We've got too much work out there in our community to get done. God's given us the opportunity. So how we treat each other with compassion and kindness, how we focus on ourselves, make sure we're humble, we're not worried about our needs, we're worried about other people's needs. We have this sense of gentleness that we are forgiving. See, I, I love the gentleness with that, that steel strength, I guess, behind it. That's really great. The third phase we see here. And above all, put on these the love, which binds everything in, peace, uh, in perfect harmony. We see the third phase here, I think, is there's a certain um, amount of long suffering, of patience that must be, go, be done. When we're bearing with one another, if we have a complaint against one another, forgiving, we're loving each other, put on love, which binds out all these in perfect harmony. This idea that we have patience, long suffering, right? That means we put up with each other when we're annoying each other. Debbie puts up with me all the time. She long suffers uh, as we're going through, right, babe? Yeah, there you go. That's the idea that we withstand difficulties and handle them with the faith of God. We, um, our number three boy played a lot of baseball and we've been all the leagues through the years. And as he got up towards high school, he'd play summer ball 
and he played high school in the spring and summer, and so pretty much most of his year was revolved around baseball. And so you, you move around and play a bunch of different baseball games. There's one particular umpire that would show up on occasion because they kind of rotate around. They, a lot of these guys really love to do it, and we appreciate umpires and referees and all those guys. They get no love from anybody. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's not going to get a lot of love from me today. But this gentleman, he would come with a certain gear on, and he was very vocal and very demonstrative when he went about his business of umpiring. And I don't know if you like baseball. I'm a baseball guy, and I really enjoy it. And you see in the major leagues when somebody strikes out, and if they're standing there watching the ball, the umpire, he'll be behind there, and then he'll, you know, he'll have this big thing. He's out, right? And this guy does that, man. You think he's a professional umpire, man. These little kids are striking out. He's like, you're out of there. Strike three, right? He's, he's gone. But what I liked about him was, like, if he's out doing the bases, if a guy slid under a tag and he thought he slid under the tag and the guy didn't tag him, he's like, you're out of there. He's under the tag. So everybody knew at least what he was thinking on that call. But here's the deal, he would make that call, but it would be a terrible call. I mean, everybody's watching, it's like, oh, he tagged him like, he put his glove down and tagged him the whole way as he was sliding in, there's no way he could possibly end safe. And it was over and over, this guy would miss a call. I mean, he, a ball going well the kid's head, you'd be standing there watching, and he's like, strike three, and the kid's like, oh, I can't swing that high, right? He looked the part, sounded the part, not very good at what he did. Let's look at our passage. Verse 15. This is a really a key passage here. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. We see the, the peace of Christ here. Let's talk about the peace of Christ here briefly. I see, when we think of the peace of Christ, I want you to think of three traits. One here is talking about the peace of Christ. That's a peace that's divine, that comes from God. It's not something that we have to generate. It's not something that we can work into. It's, a, it's something that we can ask for and receive if we're willing. The source is divine. And that takes the pressure off of us. That, that makes us realize, what is that? When you think it's the source is divine, what does that trigger in your mind? In my mind, it's like, wait a minute. If peace comes from God, then why do I care what's going on in this world? Why am I letting these things bother me that shouldn't bother me? God's in those things. He'll work those things out. I don't know how. I don't even see that there is a possibility that he's going to work out this complicated situation but I'm going to trust that he does. I see that it's divine. I see it's ruling. This idea of ruling, that his peace is ruling, it has authority. The, the passage, if you understand the, the way it's written, is it really talks about almost an umpire. We're ruling, it's like God's ruling on it and he's sorting it out, but his, is, his rulings are perfect. Here, on, if I had to be an umpire, I'd probably be a terrible umpire. I know what I'm supposed to call, but I can't call as fast as they do. But God's umpire ruling out is perfect. It's like an umpire in our lives. He's sorting through all this stuff. He knows what's right and what's wrong. We can trust that. Again, you're seeing the theme here. Our peace is when we release the stuff, the chaos in our lives to God and allow him to work through us. It's trusting that he knows best. That's what we struggle with the most, I think, as believers. We trust God. But yet we run it ourselves. Well, that's not trusting God. If you're going to run it yourself, you've got to let him have it. Third thing we see, it's a unifier. It builds unity. When we have the peace of Christ, we're not worried about all this chaos. We're not worried about whether our ego is getting stroked. We're not worried about all this other stuff. It unifies us as believers. That's why you see passage after passage driving this point home. If you'd like to keep up, turn with me to John chapter 14. This is a great passage, John chapter 14, by the way. It's, uh, um, we're going to come back and hit some passages in John 14 uh, when we talk about abundant encouragement from the Last Supper. Jesus, this is a, Jesus talking at the Last Supper. He knows he's going to go to his death soon. I mean, just within days, he's going to suffer and die for these guys. He's prepping his disciples. And he says this in verse 27. John 14, 27 says this, Peace. 
I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let, your not, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. What a great passage. He says, I leave my peace with you. I give it to you, not as the world does. Doctor in charge of peace and harmony all over the world had a crazy four-step system that is literally impossible to achieve. God says, Jesus says, don't worry about that. Don't worry, that's not how you get peace. You don't get peace by pursuing worldly things. Peace comes from me, I will give you peace. Pursue after me and I will give it to you, not in the way the world does. It's a beautiful way. See, this peace has the power to change our lives. Turn with me to uh, Philippians before we go back. It's just a, a page uh, back. Philippians chapter 4. We read this passage this morning when we opened the service, but I want to focus on verse 7. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The this peace that God gives us has the power to guard our hearts and minds. It has the power to change who we are. We need to let that power change our actions. That's a driving point. The reason is if we have peace in our lives, I'm going to guess from watching the interview with, with our pastor friend in Canada who's in jail, I bet she has a peace of God through this situation that he knows watching his wife explain what was going on, you just get a sense that they're nervous. She's nervous as a wife would be, but she has this peace of God. They are living it out in real time in a situation that's much more difficult than probably what we're dealing with today. See, this, this power, this peace can change our lives, how we go about our business. We can go from agitated, we can go from being worrisome, we can go from carrying all these burdens to just giving them to God and letting him work out. That's what he wants you to do. He wants to carry your burdens, but you just take them back and keep carrying them. Give them to him. Let that peace change who you are. Don't carry them around. There's no need to. Do you realize that um, it's a little known fact? Um, I'm excited to tell you this little story. When they went from propeller planes, the military did, we went from our prop planes to our jets, there was a technical problem they found. Because jets go way faster than the prop planes. In the old days, you got shot and your engine wasn't running and you'd kind of climb out and you'd jump out with your parachute before your plane crashed. Well, the jets, they go too fast, you can't do that. As soon as you try to do that, you'd hit the back of the plane and you would be maimed, killed, or dead, right? It's just not gonna work. And so they came up with ejection seats. So you pull the handle, the pilot pulls the handle and shoots them out, right? The canopy blows off and then the seat goes out. But the first few designs, they had a problem. One of the problems was when the pilots would pull the seats, and I think this would be our reaction, imagine just getting launched out of your plane that was perfect at one moment and now it's not so perfect anymore, that they would hang on to that handle. The problem was now they couldn't detach from their seat and the parachute's behind them and the seat's holding the parachute back. And so they had to re-engineer and come up with a design. And so what they came up with, this is my title for it, the butt blaster. The butt blaster is like a, powered whoopee cushion. It's a, it's a strap that goes from the top of the seat and the pilot sits on it and the strap goes down behind him with like a little you know, slingshot deal and goes to the front of the seat. And so what happens is when that is triggered, it's got a delay and once the pilot clears the plane, it automatically electronically pulls that, retrieves that strap and makes it go tight. So it literally launches the pilots out of the chair. That was a cool thing, a butt blaster. So you got them from being paralyzed because it's going so fast, the whole situation is to making them do something that was there to save their lives. Just launches them out of that seat so the parachute can open correctly. I like that because that's really, as we get to verse 17 in our passage, it's time for action. And that's what that does. That puts us in position 
it launches us into position. Those verses ahead of here, this, this whole book is driving towards this point to go out and do this. Let this change your life. Look at verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God, the Father, through him. Here's the thing. This is the thing that we're to do. Whatever you do, do it in the Lord. A lot of you guys have jobs out of there, out there, have jobs that you do. You know when you do those jobs, you're to do them as you're doing them unto the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's a job you hate, a job. Just do the very best you can because you're doing it as an example to others of how believers work. Everything that we do, we should do in the Lord. How we interact with our family should be something that honors God. How we interact with people in our community should be something that honors God. All these traits that we talked about, not only this morning, but in those last weeks, are building towards this point of launching us out into the community, launching us to go take care of each other. You guys are so good at taking care of when needs pop up within our church family, whether it's prayer or whatever else. Let's take that same mentality out to our community. This is a launching point. This is our kicking us out of our seats and get, us, get, our, get ourselves rolling. Whatever you do, do in the Lord. But notice, if we look, slide back to verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching you and admonishing you. This dwell, the idea is like taking and you're soaking something. And you soak something so it swells up with the water, it, it absorbs the water so you can use it. It's the same thing here. The idea is that we're to soak in God's word so it just kind of oozes out of us, a sponge. You put it in the thing and it soaks up the water and when you pull it out, it drips everywhere and you squeeze it, it has even more comes out of you. That's what's supposed to happen to us. The word of God and his grace and his stuff, when we're squeezed with the world's pressure, that's what comes out, God's word. God's commands those actions in our lives, our godly ones. We're to give thanks for the opportunities to serve him. We have so many different opportunities and neat things to do. It's exciting. So that's our challenge as we finish our study of Colossians for now. It's our point of action. We've learned a lot in Colossians. We've learned how to go about our business. We've learned how that it's important to evangelize people. It's important to be a part of our community. It's important to trust in the peace of God. But now it's time for us to go out and get it done and change people's lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we're so thankful for the peace that you give us. We ask you would uh, continue to bless our time here. I ask you would uh, help each one of us. Maybe we're carrying a burden. Maybe we've not have, we've really not had your peace in our lives. And we know that you want to generously give it to us, but we're fighting you. I ask you, you would just help that person that's, that's here this morning, that they would just give you their stuff, whatever it is. It doesn't matter how ugly they think their stuff is. You still want it. Help us each to realize that our stuff, you see everything that's in us, and you want to help us to have a sense of peace about our lives. Help us to pursue this spiritual peace. Help us to, help us to really affect us not only spiritually but physically. Help us to be aggressively eager to get out into our community and share your love. We ask that you would give us opportunities this week to show your, your kindness and your love to our community. Continue to ask us to be with us as we take your elements today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.